I unfortunately don't have an Easter in the West message today. I almost did this week, kind of a thematic message, but it just didn't work out that way, so pardon me on that. But I want to talk about something else. Um, I'm going to open up with one of the more sobering passages in Scripture, and I want to really explore it, and I'm hoping it doesn't have to stay in that you know, territory of kind of sobriety and intensity, but I do want to, I do want to look at it. Um, I say one of the most. It might actually be the most, depending on who you ask. So in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, and again, you don't have to turn there. It's just two or three verses, and for most of us, they're pretty familiar. Jesus is concluding his Sermon on the Mount. He's concluding his, you know, the greatest sermon ever preached, the new life, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to fulfill all things in him, all of these beautiful themes. And near the end, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a really intense passage. And what strikes me the first several times I read this several years ago was the very ending. He says, I will declare to them not that they never knew him. That's kind of what I would expect. Like, hey, we've done all these things, but you know, they've missed the mark. They haven't understood what the heart of Christianity is. They're really off course, and so they really never knew Christ. They never really knew God. But no, he doesn't say that. He says, I never knew you. So what do we do with that? Um, and even through, theirs, through the epistles, um, there's a place of being known by God, not just knowing God. In 1 Corinthians 8, 3, Paul writes, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Well, what does that mean? Doesn't God know everything? Like, how are you known by God? And then the passage we just read seems to suggest that there's a place of not being known by God, which is a terrifying concept. Um, the, you know, originator of all things, um, not having place in his mind for you, not knowing you. That's a terrifying concept. In Galatians 4.9, Paul writes again, you have come to know God, comma, or rather to be known by God. Again, this theme of being known by God. What does it mean to be known by God? So how does this happen? What does this mean? That's kind of some of what I want to talk about tonight. Um, and I, as I am ought to do, I want to take the scenic route. Um, and I want to talk about clothing. I'm going to talk about clothing. This is not going to be a message on modesty. It's not going to be, you know, a message on the, you know, nuts and bolts of how we should clothe ourselves in the world, although those are important topics. But I want to talk about clothing in as much as it's related to our identity. And that in a sense, our clothing is part of our identity. And you can talk about the various identities that we have in the world. You can talk about them, and even the scriptures do talk about them, as clothing. So clothing is identity, identity is clothing. There's this very close connection between the two. And you can kind of think of some real world examples with this. Um, if you see, you know, Jack, the guy down the street, and he's out mowing his lawn, and you know, hey, neighbor Jack. And then all of a sudden it's a Monday and he goes to work and he puts on a police officer uniform. That adds to his identity. All of a sudden there's something about his identity that's very closely tied with the clothes that he puts on. Um, He's taken on that identity for himself. The same with a soldier. Um, you see all these soldiers and the military is obsessed with you know, the uniform and make sure the hair and all this stuff. And it's not because you know, they're worried about the wrinkles in your uniform and you're going to look like bad when you go to combat. That's not what they're worried about. They're worried about what does this say about your identity. And ideally, you're someone that we can form and shape and mold to what use we would have to be you know, a fighter, to do X, Y, and Z, whatever the military would want you to do. The same with a doctor, the same with a judge. Like you see neighbor um, you know, Chris down the road, and then Monday comes and it's time to go to work and he puts on the gowns of a judge, a justice of the United States of America. That's quite an identity. And even with that clothes, as soon as he puts that on, he's actually a representative for something else. 
and that there's certain things you can do in uniform, so to say, even in the military, and certain things you cannot do in uniform, because when you put that on, you are implicating something. You are taking on an identity. You're taking on you know, the identity of the United States, all of this stuff. So all that to say, identity is closely tied with clothing. How many of us have heard of the Stanford Prison Experiment? OK, about half or so. So there was this experiment. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was in the 70s. All the crazy stuff happened in the 70s, apparently. Um, this experiment, they took some college undergrads, I believe, and they gave them random numbers. So I forgot what the exact number was. Let's say it's 12 or 20 or whatever it is. And half of those students, just random students, they would give prison clothes. And you are a prisoner just because you draw, pretty much draw out of a hat. OK, I'm a prisoner. I'm taking that role. So you would dress in like the orange jumpsuit. You would go to the basement of this you know, college building. And they would make a makeshift prison. The other half would be the guards. And so they received the costume, the clothing, the uniform of the guards, you know, the um, tucked in khaki shirt and the hat and maybe the badge and especially the glasses. And they would wear the, um, the garb of a guard. And you'd have this makeshift prison. And again, all of these are just random students at an undergrad university. None of them have anything to do with guards or prisons. And so it's completely random. And how, for those of you who don't know, how do you think, what, what do you think happened? Like when they're doing this makeshift prison experiment with random people being the prisoners, random people being the guards. Anyone have any guesses? It's okay. Um, they were going to do this experiment, I think, for two weeks, and they had to cut it short. Again, I don't have all the, I should have had all the facts, but they, I think they cut it short at about one week because the conditions became so hostile and so downright abusive that they had to cut the experiment for safety reasons. Within one week, fellow classmates, normal, you know, 18 to 22 year olds that are classmates, within one week, six of them, or whatever that half number is, became so abusive and so tyrannical over the others that they had to cut the experiment short because of safety. And so simply by putting on that identity, by putting on those clothes, by putting on the glasses, their identity was changed. And they started to act and they started to like do push-ups and they started to deny the people food and put them in solitary confinement. And I think there was like physical you know, assaults and all this stuff simply by putting on the clothes. And several of the prisoners took on this posture of submission and humility, all because of the number that they drew and the clothes that they put on. So all this to say, clothing is very tied to our identity. I recognize, you know, of those of you who I do recognize, I recognize in part because you're dressed like you normally dress. If Brother Matthew had walked in wearing a Santa Claus costume, I would have to do a double take. I wouldn't recognize him immediately. If Brother Paul walked in wearing a tuxedo, I'd have to do a double take. I wouldn't recognize him immediately, simply because of the clothes that people have chosen to wear. So with this framework in mind, I want to go back to the very beginning, at least a little, a little bit after the very beginning. I want to go back to the fall. What was the first thing that happened after the purity and innocence um, was corrupted? After Eve ate the fruit after Adam ate the fruit. What was the very first thing that happened? They saw that each other were naked, and therefore they sewed themselves, or did they sew themselves clothes and then hide themselves? Yeah, I think they sewed themselves clothes first. And so they sewed themselves clothes. So there's a lot of commentary on this in you know, every commentary that you read. Everyone's going to have a different take. There's a lot of exciting, you know, very lofty, patristic commentary that would be fun to get into, but I don't think we have the time. Um, but there's this, ide the, this idea that the very first thing you want to do is like hold on to some sort of identity. Like, just like we can't survive in the wilderness without clothes, especially up in the north here in Boston. I can't just go out and live the whole year you know, without clothes. It would literally be physically impossible. I would die. I would perish. In the same way, especially since the fall, we can't survive in the world without some sort of identity. Like we have to have some sort of identity to make sense of the world around us. And all that to say, the moral of this story should be very obvious that clothing isn't bad. 
That's not the moral of the story. We're all wearing clothing, thank goodness. So clothing's not bad. This sense of identity is not bad. We need them, just like we need clothing. We need identities to make sense of ourselves, to make sense of others, like I relate to you based off of our identities. Um, and that's why we have many identities, just like we have many sets of clothes. And we put them on like clothes. As soon as I got married, I put that identity on like a set of clothes. Now, I'm not just David, the single you know, student and son and brother. I'm also David, the husband. As soon as I had children, I put on a new identity, kind of like a set of clothes. You put it on. Now, I'm also David, the father. And so you can see how we start to collect these identities that um, I am a husband, I'm a father, I'm a churchman, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a student, I'm a Westerner, I'm, you know, a citizen of the United States. There's all of these different identities that I have, and none of them are bad in and of themselves. There are some identities that are bad. We'll not get there. Um, but the question is, what is our ultimate identity? If we start to stack those identities, like treat those like a hierarchy, what's at the top and what's at the bottom? And that's where the problems start to come in. What's our ultimate identity? When I think of who I am in the world, who am I ultimately? Am I ultimately a father? Am I ultimately a mother? Like the buck stops with this. At the end of the day, I am a father. I am a mother. Or maybe I am ultimately a son or a daughter, ultimately a husband or a wife. Maybe ultimately, at the end of the day, when I think of myself, I'm ultimately a self-made man. I pulled myself up, I did the hard work, and I've created, created myself. Maybe that's our identity. Maybe ultimately, at the end of the day, we think of ourselves as a victim of circumstance. Maybe ultimately, we think of ourselves as a failure. Whatever it is, it's worth thinking about what is our identity. Maybe at the end of the day, I think of myself as a righteous man. That's my ultimate identity. Save that for a different sermon. But all of these, in a sense, are self-created identities. They're identities that we put on, that we make for ourselves. I chose to get married. We chose to have children. I chose to be a student. Um, and as we saw in Genesis, we like to do that. We like to sew our own clothes. We like to make our own identities. It's something comforting and something like a knee-jerk reaction for us to make sense of the world around us. Does that make sense? We like to sew our own clothes. To use a different you know, picture, we like to make a name for ourselves. Where was the first time that we hear that phrase in the Bible, by the way? To make a name for ourselves. The Tower of Babel. Again, there's this human impulse that in the midst of you know, the craziness of this world, the craziness of existence, at the end of the day, there's a comfort and a security of sewing our own clothing, of making a name for ourselves. We like to make our own identities. And that being said, there's two big glaring problems with that. Again, these identities aren't bad, but there's two problems. First, we're really bad at making things that last. We are very bad at making things that are permanent. And that's because, you know, when we were created, we weren't permanent. We're not God. We're created as creatures. We're created with a lifespan. We're created as, you know, bound by time. You know, I could go on and on, but we're not um, eternal. We get into this idea too, like in all this topic, or all this talk in the scriptures about the world, like why is the world so bad? It's opposed to God, it's enmity. But part of it is because it's passing away. Um, First John writes, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So the sense that in as much as we identify ourselves with the world, we're identifying ourselves with something that passes away. And when that passes away, so do we. Uh-oh. I have a, speaking of being a father. <laughs> um, thank you, Matthew. <laughs> And we see this theme throughout the scriptures that Jesus says, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted, what will happen to those? They will be pulled up by the roots. So something about what God makes is permanent. What we make is impermanent. Um, 
We see this theme throughout the scriptures, the theme of chaff, the theme of dross, all these externals that we add to ourselves. Like when you're, you know, going and making bread and, you know, threshing the wheat, there's this external part that's useless. It's chaff. There's nothing useful about it, and it gets burned away. It gets thrown away by the wind. Or dross, like when you're creating this beautiful sculpture and, like, you put it into the fire, those things that aren't pure, you know, silver, gold, whatever it have you, those are the things that just burn away and fall away. Jesus says that he will destroy with the brightness of his coming. He says that everything will be brought to light. Everyone will be salted by fire, which is a very important passage. It's not just, you know, the bad people get the fire, the good people don't get the fire. Every single person will be salted by fire. And the differentiation between those two is who, has, who can survive the fire? There's this passage in um, Isaiah, I don't have it, but it just popped into my head, where it says, who can dwell with, I think, in the everlasting flame? Like, who, is, who, is, who can dwell in that? And our knee-jerk response is like, oh, all the bad people, that's where the bad people go. And the response that the prophet says is those who walk uprightly, those who do not accept bribes, those pretty much the, the just, the righteous, because those are the people that have built something that can last that fire, that can last that testing. And Paul says that every work will be tried by fire. So, there's a place before God where all is brought into light, and certain things do survive, and certain things don't survive. So think about this with our identities. Because again, we like to make our own identities, but we're very bad at making things that last. Um, so, the question then stands, what happens when our own identities are that? What happens when my identity is dross, when my identity is chaff, when my identity are those things that aren't lasting, especially my ultimate identity? And it's a really bad place to be. That's why Isaiah and Revelation talks about men hiding in the crags of the rock on the day of judgment because The second problem is, if Christ calls his sheep by name, what happens if we've made a different name for ourselves? Does that make sense? If Christ calls his sheep by name, and I'm assuming that most of us here would think that he's calling everyone to salvation, and yet he's calling his sheep by name, how come everyone's not saved? Well, what happens if we've made a different name for ourselves? What happens if we're like those who built the Tower of Babel? I've made a name for myself, but ultimately it's not the name that God had for me. It's something that I've constructed myself. So when Jesus calls us by name, we simply just don't recognize it, and we don't respond to the call. What happens when we become different people than the people that God has called and known and made us to be? And there's the example of Israel in this, that Israel is God's people all throughout the Old Testament, his covenant faithfulness, all these beautiful images. The whole pattern of the Old Testament is God being faithful to his people. And they started off as a people poor in spirit who wanted freedom and followed God, these core parts of their identity. A people enslaved in Egypt, poor in spirit, wanted freedom, were willing to follow Moses. And over time, that starts to change. Over time, they start wanting things other than that. They start grumbling. And what do they grumble for? Food, drink, even their old lives in Egypt, the leeks. If anyone has heard that song, there's a song all about, like, you want to go back to Egypt, you want the leeks. Um, and so this identity starts to grow and grow as they're complaining more and more and more, and they've moved away from that identity of total reliance on God, total poverty of spirit. They've moved away from God, and eventually they're starting to think, we're victims of a God that doesn't know what he's doing. Like, we're a mess in the wilderness. We're just being led hither and yon. Does God really know what he's doing? And finally, they say, this is, oh, man, I don't have the reference. Um, I think it's from Numbers, maybe Exodus. There's a quote from the people of Israel. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. And so we start as a people poor in spirit who are following God, and we've ended up as a whole different people, a people that would rather die than go through what they're going through. And so, they've taken on a new identity. 
And God affirms that identity later throughout the prophets. He says, you were once my people. Now you are not my people. I'm affirming that identity. So um, this is also why our day-to-day -day actions are important, because that didn't come out of nowhere. It's not just like one day we got out of Egypt, and the next day it's like, we want to die. It started off with this grumbling. It started off with this complaining. And as those went unchecked over and over and over, our, their identity slowly started to change into a new people. And it's the same with us. Um, Every single day we're making decisions, you know, that's unavoidable. Every single day we're making decisions. And those decisions are never neutral. They might be small, they might be seemingly inconsequential, but there's no neutral decision that just ultimately doesn't matter. Every single decision that we're making is ultimately strengthening our identity or changing our identity, reassessing our identity for better or for worse. And so, that's why we can never rest on the laurels of our past achievement, of our past faith, of like, oh, I remember back in the days of my youth, I was such a vibrant Christian, so that means I'm good to go today. Well, that, no, that's not how it works. Every single day is a new call to new decisions. And if over time and over several years, we've started to veer away from that through these small decisions, we start to become a different person because our decisions create who we are. Like, who are we other than the sum total of our decisions that we make? So every day we're rehearsing our identity. There's a quote, um, I kind of quoted it already, um, from a book I've been reading. Habits may be small or unconscious, but they are never neutral. So the habits that we do every single day, they may be small, they may be unconscious, we might not even know that we're doing them, but they're never neutral. Say every single day I read the no news as soon as I come home from work for 30 minutes. You know, that's not, it's neither here nor there, but it's, Ultimately, like if I do that a day, two, three, like that's not going to drastically change me. But if that starts to become the course of my life for years and years and years on end, that starts to shape my worldview, starts to shape who I am. Um, maybe every single day I'm prioritizing my finances. I'm you know, going on online forums and learning about X, Y, and Z and investing and making sure my finances are in order. And like that's all good. You should have your finances in order. But if that starts to become the water that you swim in, that starts to become your identity. That starts, you start to be a person that is serving money rather than God. And so if we're not conscious of our actions, if we're not conscious of our habits, they're shaping us into things that we don't know what, what it's going to be. Think of like a rut with a wagon wheel. You guys have all heard the expression of being in a rut, right? It's actually a really good expression if you think about it. What is a rut? Anyone want to define a rut for me? Yeah, it's a groove in the ground because these wagon wheels, think of the Oregon Trail, you're like wagons over and over and over and over and they're just pressing the ground down until you have this indentation in the ground and all of a sudden it's hard for those wagon wheels to break out of it. And so ruts are very helpful. They're not always a bad thing. They helped people, you know, it's a lot easier to travel in a wagon over a rut than it is over bumpy ground. And so ruts are helpful in that they take us somewhere. The problem is, if we're not aware of the ruts that we're in, they take us places that we don't, we don't know where they're going, and they might not be places that we like. And so if you're in a good rut, you know, rut has such a negative connotation, but if you're in a good rut where every single day the patterns of your life are shaped by, you know, godliness and prayer and reliance on God and service of the saints and all of these things, that's a rut and it's taking you somewhere, it's taking you to a great place. But if every single day you are in a different type of rut, you know, you can't look at any one decision that you've made that day and say, oh, that was the decision, it just messed me up for life. No, it's the sum total of these decisions over and over and over that are shaping your identity to be a different person. And so, by the end of it, we've put on clothes, and we might not have even realized we've put on clothes. We've put on a new identity, and we might not have even realized we've put on an identity. Um, and the problem, again, is that these identities, if they're self-made, aren't lasting. They're not going to stand the test. And so, if my identity is ultimately or only as a father or a successful father, maybe that's who I identify myself as, you know, first, what does that mean apart from God? I don't know. But second, that's something of my own making. It's, you know, God's not in the picture of that. Or if he is, he's in a minor picture of that. Maybe my identity is ultimately a successful student. At the end of the day, I am a successful student. I get all the good grades, and it's going to lead. This rut is going to lead me to a successful career, and I'm going to be a, a great, you know, whatever. You know, that's great if that's your ultimate goal. 
But Lord willing, for all of us, that's not our ultimate goal. And so we have to be mindful of these decisions that we're making because they shape our identity. And as we're putting on these identities, we might not be aware of it. And then, going back to this point, at the end of time, when we're standing before God, that's the test. It's not whether you know God or you know of God. It's whether God knows you. He designed you and made you to be someone. And if we've decided to be someone else, that's where there's the danger of God saying, depart, I never knew you. This person standing in front of me, I don't recognize him. I don't recognize her. I created you to be something, and this person is someone totally different than that, just like Israel. I'm looking at you, Israel, and I don't recognize you. You were my people, now you are not my people. And that's not God just making the decision of like, oh, arbitrarily, you're my people, not my people. No, it's simply an affirmation of what Israel had already chosen for themselves. Okay, so the theme there is what happens when God in the final day calls on all those who are Christ's, and that's become such a minor part of my identity that I no longer hear it. It's kind of similar to the person invited to the wedding feast, and it's like, oh, no, I've got all these other things. Like, I've got fields and commitments and a wife and cows and all this stuff, which, you know, cows and fields and wives are not bad things. But if that becomes our ultimate identity, that's where we actually miss out on the entirety of the wedding feast. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Like, there's all this stuff about, like, blatant sin. That's a problem. Like, you've got to cut that out of your life. There's, you know, a whole score of messages about that. But what about all these warnings that Jesus gives to people who are doing seemingly good things? Like, oh, the guy that is taking care of his wife and farm and cows, all of a sudden he misses out on the wedding feast? Like, what's up with that? And it's this, this misplacement of identity. So, thus far, we've talked about our identity is clothing. You know, it's stuff that you can put on, take off. And sometimes we get so used to our clothing that we forget this, and it becomes unconscious. We also learn that we can't, well, I mean, we can make our own, but it's a really bad decision if we're making our own and relying on that, because we can't make things that last. We're not eternal. So, and we see this pattern in the scriptures, that Adam and Eve made their own clothes. They made fig leaves. And then what did God do with that? It wasn't sufficient. Instead of taking what Adam and Eve had made, he gave them something else. He gave them garments of skin. All of a sudden, that's something more sufficient. That's something that comes from God. At Babel, humanity makes a name for themselves. You know, it's like that self-made man imagery. Like, I'm going to go make a name for myself in the world and be great. Well, what does God do with us? In Revelation, I think, chapter 2, it's to those who overcomes. He gives a new name written on a white stone. And so just like God gives Adam and Eve, you know, new clothes, he gives us a new name, that all of this pattern is pointing to God giving us something. And that's where we should be basing our identities. Um, the Proverbs say that many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purposes of the Lord that will stand. So we have all these different thoughts of who we could be and what we could do and like all the great things that we could accomplish, you know, and those are neither here nor there, but ultimately they're inconsequential because it's the purposes of God that stand. So what's the answer with all this? What do we do with all this? I'm hoping it's, hoping it's relatively obvious. Um, it has to do with Christ. Paul actually addresses this in Romans 13, and he uses the exact same imagery. Um, that I've been talking about. He says, rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think of how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And remember that flesh for Paul isn't just like, you know, you know, alcohol, sexuality, like these very carnal things. Flesh can also be pride. Flesh can also, like, it's tied to the world. So the pride of life, the desires of the eyes, all these things that are beyond just like these carnal here and now um, desires, we're not supposed to be gratifying the desires of the flesh, broadly speaking. And then he straight up says, clothe yourselves with Jesus Christ. So take Jesus, just like in the morning, you wake up, you put on your clothes, you get your shower, whatever, you start the day. That's what he's telling you to do with Christ. Put Jesus on like a garment. And that's an identity. That's an identity that's going to last. 
And so that's the exhortation for what I'm trying to get to us, is to rethink of our identities. Um, so go through your mind real quick. I'll give you like a generous 10 seconds. Um, and think about all the different identities that you have, the ways that you operate in the world. For me, just some of them that pop up are student, father, husband, churchman, maybe it's mother, maybe it's seeker, maybe it's, um, I don't know, poet. I don't know what has you. So think about the identities, all the, way, all the different identities that you have. And now start to arrange those in a hierarchy and say, which of these are more foundational and which of these are less foundational? And I hope that they're not all on an even plane. Like my identity as a husband is a lot higher than my identity as a student. And if that's inverted, you know, that's its own problems. And we see that where people like, oh, my identity as an executive, that's way more important than my identity as a family man. Yeah, that's a problem. And then think of what, you, what is at the top of that, at the very top, your ultimate identity. And it's almost like two different questions. What would you want your identity, be, identity to be and what is your identity? So I'm hoping that for all of us, we would want our identity to be Christ's, to be in Christ, to be of Christ, to be God's, like all of this imagery. So that's the goal. And then think realistically, is that my ultimate identity? When I'm honest with myself. So all of these different things are good, but they all have to be in Christ. He has to be at the top. Because otherwise, when that final day comes, we've misplaced our identities, and he's calling someone, and there's a chance you might not be that someone, because he's calling those who are his sons. He's calling those who are in Christ. And so if we misorder, you think of that chain of identities, if you misorder our identities, we commit, you know, one, we commit a sort of idolatry in that being a father is more intrinsic to my identity than even being Christ's. Like, being Christ's is great, and I really value that, but ultimately, I am a good father. I'm going to be a father. And that becomes a sort of idol in our lives. And again, being a father is not bad, but when it's prioritized above God, whether intentionally or unintentionally, or if our work life, or if our student life, or if whatever has you has become prioritized above God, either intentionally or unintentionally, that's the danger. That's what God is calling us to recognize and correct. So that's the first problem. The second problem is every single thing other than Christ is circumstantial. If we think about Romans 9, I think it's, no, Romans 8. Yeah, Romans 8, where it says, like, neither height nor depth will take us away, you know, um, someone else could quote that far better than me. I'll do a terrible paraphrase, but no one will take us away from the love of Christ, whether powers, principalities, whether life nor death, all this stuff. What he's saying is that Christ isn't circumstantial. He's the rock that stays forever. He's the center of it all. He is eternal. He's the son of God. Every single other identity that we have is circumstantial. There might be a day where I'm no longer a father, you know, God forbid, but it might happen. There might be a day where I'm no longer a husband. There might be a day where I'm no longer a student. And so if I vested my whole identity in that, and that disappears, then what do I have left? I'm nothing. And God is saying, no, you've misprioritized this. No matter what happens, you are Christ's. And so that's, that's what it means to be a Christian, you know, just like what it means to be a human is that ultimately we're all of Adam. Like every single one of us here is of Adam. Otherwise, we wouldn't be human. It's the same way every single one of us here who's Christian is of Christ, the second Adam. Otherwise, we would not be Christians. Um, so we must all trace ourselves back to Christ. Otherwise, we're just simply not God's people. And this is helpful because it's not something that we achieve. It's not something that I've gone out and conquered and, you know, I've taken over and the self-made man imagery where I can, like, point to a time and said, thank goodness I'm awesome and now I'm Christ. It's like, no, you've missed the whole
Christ won't be forgotten. So, all that being said, it takes a lot of honesty and humility to be honest. It takes honesty to be honest. <laughs> Go figure. Um, I'll say it for lack of better terms. It takes honesty and humility to be honest about our identities. Like, it would be really easy to walk away from this message and be like, hey, amen, I'm of Christ, moving on. But really, take a look inside of your heart, inside of your life, and ask the question, who am I ultimately? Um, and it's a hard question. And it's really easy to want to defer to what other, people's, to what other people think. We want other people to make that decision for us. Um, we see this in Israel where it's like we want you know, Moses to go solve our problems. We want him to go up to the mountaintop. Or we want a king. We want a king to fight our own battles. Like we don't want to have to do the hard work. And it's the same sometimes in the church. Like I just want the church to figure things out for me. And that's all great with doctrine and all this stuff. But they can't figure out your identity for you. That's something that you have to figure out before God. Um, and this honesty can be really painful because looking back at this picture of like chaff and dross, if I've started to build an identity that's part of like made up of chaff and made up of dross, that's a really painful experience to realize because those things have to get burnt away either now or in the age to come. And that honesty is painful. Like, say my identity is 99% chaff, and I bring that to the light, and I bring that to God, and that all gets burnt away. How much of me just got burnt away? 99% of me. That's a really painful experience. But it's going to happen. That's the promise, and that's the warning, that, and the... The glory that Jesus is promising to the whole earth is that there is going to be a day where judgment happens. It's not necessarily some legal you know, court case where he smacks the gavel. It's like a judgment or a trying of like the clay pot. You put it into the fire and you know, you've molded this pot for three months and finally you put it into the fire to see what it's got and it all disappears and like, oh, well, there it goes. And we don't want that to be our lives. And so I want to call us all to step into that and have time to really ponder that and think about that and bring, bring ourselves to the light and let God, let God judge for us. How much of us are chaff? How much of us is dross? How much have we mispositioned our identities? Um, I have a quote here. Honesty many times entails repentance. To be honest, I, I'm... I'll say it this way rhetorically. I, I'm not going to you know, defend it as a statement of fact. But to be honest is to repent. To be honest is to realize how small you are, how you often do miss the mark, how um, you sometimes have misaligned your identities, how all of these different things. And when you're honest, you're able to repent. And that's why the publican was justified. And that's why the Pharisee wasn't justified. At the end of the day, the publican, what did he say? He said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And that was his identity there. But a sinner is someone that God can work with. Someone who thinks that they're righteous, that's not someone that God can work with. It's like if you, were, if you said that you were blind, like I'd, we'd be able to work with you. But because you say you see, like I can't do anything here. And so I want to ask that to us, and it's again, it's gonna be a personal thing. I mean, you might be able to discuss it amongst ourselves, but ultimately it's a very personal question. Who am I prior primarily? If my identity is primarily in Christ, and he's my cornerstone, it's a good thing. And if my identity is primarily not in Christ, it's a good thing to know, and it's a good thing to know now, so that we can get to a place of decision, so that we can get to a place where we can fix that. And so I tied this to the question where Jesus says, who do people say that I am? When he asks you know, the disciples, who do people say that I am? And what's their response? You know, Some say this, others say this, others say this. And then he switches the question. He narrows it down. Who do you say that I am? All of a sudden, it's a second person address. It's something that no one else can answer for them. Christ asks me, who do you say that I am? I can't say, well, you know, brother this says you're this, or sister this says you're this, and like that's a really great sounding thing. It doesn't matter. Who do you say that I am? And the biblical answer is, if you can speak with your life who I am, 
then I will tell you who you are. And I will tell you whether I know you. Okay. So what, another point that I want to say is that it's an act of faith to identify with Christ. There's a lot of times in our life where it might not feel like an act of faith. You know, when there's amazing things happening, you're making disciples left and right, you feel the joy of the Spirit. Like, it's not a hard thing to say, I am Christ's first and foremost. That's a pretty easy thing to do. But what happens when that's not the case? What happens when things are turbulent? What happens when things are confusing? What happens when things are dark, when you're not seeing the fruit pop up left, right, and center? What happens in those difficult times? That's where it's difficult to say, even in the midst of this, I am still Christ. That's how it's an act of faith. Um, And it's an act of faith to trust Christ more than you trust yourself in those moments. You can get to this place where, like, I think this, or I'm this, or I'm a failure because of this, or I've done this, or I, X, Y, and Z. And that's still relying on what you're thinking versus taking a step of faith and saying, even in the midst of all of that, I have all these thoughts of who I am, but I'm going to trust Christ, that he knows who I am, and I'm his. Okay. So I want to move to one indicator that you might have your priorities misaligned. There's a simple indicator, hopefully. Um, And it's not a lack of ministry. It's not like, oh, you know, I don't have this amazing flourishing ministry. I I must not be of Christ. That's not it. It's not material well-being, you know, or lack of well-being. Like, oh, I have all of these amazing things in life. I must not be Christ. Or, oh, I have nothing. And like, all of these material things are happening to me. I must not be of Christ. That's not it. It's not influence, it's not any of those things. So the one indicator, when you're looking at those identities where you may have misplaced your identities, the one indicator that at least I've come across is a lack of peace, like an ultimate lack of peace. Like no matter what you do, you're always feeling this lack of peace. And that's probably an indicator that you have your identities mixed up. And so if that describes you, I'm hoping you can take this as an opportunity to really press into who am I? And I say it's a lack of peace because Jesus tells his disciples, tells us in the scriptures, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. You know, I don't give it something that's passing away or circumstantial or comes and goes. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So there's a lot of interesting things about this passage. Um, Excuse me. The first thing is that it's not a command. It's not like Christ says, be at peace. That's one of my commands on the Sermon on the Mount. Go do it. Go accomplish it. It's not a command. It's simply a gift. He says, peace I give to you. It's a gift. Um, I'd already mentioned it, but it's not a peace like the world that, you know, we all feel peace at some times, and we all have that peace taken away at some times. When things come or go and life ebbs and flows, it's not situational. It's something deeper. It's something that can survive even in the deepest of the nights, whether physical or, you know, metaphorical. I don't know if any of you have been up at, like, 3 in the morning and, like, had all these thoughts or something. And, like, that's where a lot of real spiritual work can happen. That's why, the, that's why the psalmist oftentimes says he's keeping the watches of the night. There's something about being up at the night where it's just you and God, where there's a lot of serious soul work that can be done. And it's a peace that can last in those. Like, no matter the thoughts that come, no matter the onslaught of all these self-doubts and discouragements and all this stuff, if you ultimately have your identity in Christ, there will be a peace. And if we don't have that peace, it's because we've traded it away. We've given it away. Because, again, it's a gift. Christ didn't go say, go achieve it, go do it, go conquer it. He said, I give it to you. It's like me handing you the keys to a new car. Here you go. And if you don't have those keys, it's because you lost them, or you traded it away, or you thought something was better. It's the same with peace. Maybe we've traded away our peace for a feeling of self-reliance. Like, if I have to rely on Christ's peace, I can't rely on myself. That's uncomfortable. So instead, I'll just, I'll just rely on myself. And all of a sudden, I've traded my peace away. This feeling of control. Like, if you are walking for a long time in the kingdom, there's going to be a lot of times in your life where you don't feel like you have control. And so if you really just want to take the horns of life and say, I'm going to control my own destiny, I'm going to have my own feelings of control, 
that's going to result in a lack of peace. Um, and so if we don't have that peace, we've traded it away. It's our gift, our birthright, our identity. We've traded it for something else. And this can include good things, like I've traded away my peace so that I can be an awesome evangelist or minister that's doing all these amazing works for God. And like, you know, we baptized a thousand people last year. But at the end of the day, when it's just me and God, I feel a profound lack of peace. You see this in a lot of like megachurch ministries where the pastors are deeply struggling, potentially with like sin, potentially with I don't even think I'm a Christian. They're doing all these visibly like seemingly amazing things. And so we can even trade peace away for things that seem good. But ultimately, it's a check on ourselves. Like, when I go to sleep at night, am I at peace? And if I'm not, it's because I've given it away. And it's an invitation to accept it again. Again, it's not something that you have to do. It's not something you have to achieve. All you have to do is say, Christ, I am yours. I'll accept that peace. Regardless of what comes and goes, even if I make 50 mistakes the next day, I'm just going to repent and get back up and keep going because ultimately I am yours. And that's where there's peace. So, I want to give us a few takeaways, as we are ought to do in our messages. You know, you get to the quote practicals, because everything beforehand is impractical. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> that's how it feels sometimes. It's like, okay, here's the practicals. All that fluff has got now. Um, so, what are some takeaways? The first is pray with honesty. And again, duh. But also, how often do we do that? And you know, if you've been at my agape table over the past year, like there's several times where I don't do that. Like I can pray before meals. I might, you know, I call it shooting off prayers to God, and that's not bad. But it's still not getting to the heart of prayer. Praying and putting yourself before God in an honest disposition. Christ tells us to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. That not all worship is spirit and in truth. And so when we pray with honesty. We have to enter into judgment with ourselves. We have to be honest with who we are and say, like, God, I'm just not, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. I've totally misaligned my life. I've spent, you know, 300 hours out of the past week, which there's more hours that I've spent than there are in a week doing X, Y, and Z, and none of it's about you. It's really helpful, too, to, for this exercise to kind of escape whatever bubble you're in. We often get in these bubbles in life. Um, my bubble is Boston. And, you know, Boston's a great bubble. It's a fun bubble. But um, it's a bubble, and it's hard to see clearly. Have, have any of you gone on an, air, um, on an airplane? <laughs> Who here's flown? <laughs> One person, great. Um, has anyone had an experience where you start, like, thinking almost in a different way on an airplane? You start thinking about life, like, in a bigger... No one... Someone, yeah, okay, Whew. okay, cool. So for me, that's, that's really helpful. Like all of a sudden you get on an airplane, you're flying to somewhere you never go, and you start thinking about life in a different way. You've escaped the bubble. Like when you're in a bubble, you can't see the bubble. It's kind of explanatory. As soon as you step out, you can see the whole bubble. That's really helpful for figuring out your life. Maybe it's going on a retreat. Maybe it's going on a camping trip. Maybe it's stopping for like a weekend and just, you know, stopping your normal life and going out and doing something different where you can get a perspective of life. People t call this a mountaintop experience. Why do they call it a mountaintop experience? You know, there's a lot of biblical stuff. You know, Moses is on a mountain. But even physically, when you're on a mountain, you can see. Like, if I'm in the valley, all I can see is the stuff around me. When I'm in a mountain, I can see everything. And so it becomes us to find these mountains and be able to see our lives. The Proverbs say to ponder the path of our feet. Ponder the path of our feet. This gets back to that rut. Um, they weren't... I guess, big on wagons back in the days of the Proverbs. But it's that same idea. Ponder the rut that you're in. The, proverb, the writer of the Proverbs is saying, like, your feet are going in a direction. You're like a shark. You're always moving. There's never just some time where you've stopped completely. You're always going somewhere. And they say, be wise about that. Because your feet might take you somewhere where you don't want to be. And so ponder the path of your feet. Where am I actually going in life? What am I actually doing? All these kind of existential questions. But those aren't bad. Like, Christians should be an existential people. We're dealing with matters of utmost concern. So pray with honesty, enter to judgment with yourself, all of this stuff. The second is vote for your identity or affirm your identity with your daily decisions. Think of your daily decisions like votes that you're casting. Every single day, 
You are making decisions that are shaping who you are. Because again, your life is the sum total of your decisions. So start choosing things that are going to produce the type of life, the type of person, the type of identity that you want to be. If every single day you're burnt out and stressed out and you, know, you have this complete lack of peace, start doing different things. <laughs> um, so either vote for or affirm your identity with your daily decisions. Kind of take stock of what are the habits that I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I just, you know, maybe I realize that I'm spending three hours on social media every night. I get up in the morning, I check the news, and like my patterns of life are almost entirely conditioned by all this stuff that, you know, isn't ultimately helping me. And I might pray once a week, once a day, I don't know. But boy, you better, check the, you better bet that I'm checking the news all the time. Like that's something good to know. Um, and part of this is that we get to put on Christ daily. Paul tells us to put on Christ daily. And it wraps around to being known by God because the scriptures say, he who loves God is known by God. He who loves God is known by God. And he who loves God is he who keeps the commandments of his son. So he who loves God is known by God. He who loves God is he who keeps the commandments of his son. Therefore, he who keeps the commandments of his son is he who is known by God. And so part of your daily decision is to figure out what's one thing that I can do today simply because Jesus said do it. What's one thing that I can avoid today simply because Jesus said don't do it. And there's a lot of stuff to do. You could, there's a lot of material to work with. Like maybe today I'm just going to focus on being poor in spirit. Maybe today I'm going to focus on making peace with a relationship that's strained. Maybe today I'm going to try to intentionally do something amazing and do something beautiful and righteous and make sure that nobody knows about it. These are all daily things that you can choose. Maybe today I'm not going to seek to control other people and rule over other people, but I'm going to serve them instead. And I'm going to go about my life and my day and say, you know what, I'm going to consider someone else's interests more important than I, and I'm going to take on the form of a servant. Maybe today I'm going to just choose to not be anxious about the future. That one is a commandment, actually. So there is a choice there. I can choose to be anxious about the future, or I can choose to not be anxious. And Jesus tells us. I'm going to judge that person so that I'm not judged. Maybe today it's putting away lust. Maybe today it's someone doing something just really horrible to you, and you're just going to choose not to resist. And you're going to say, OK, let it be done. Give your cheek to the one who slaps. Maybe today it's praying for people who've wronged us. I'm going to make a habit where every morning I'm going to find one or two people that have like really wronged me, and I feel this certain way about them. And I'm going to pray for them and pray for their well-being. These are all in obedience to God. And as we do that, we're obeying the commands of Christ. We're being known by God, and we're shaping an identity of being Christ. And maybe today it's giving to those that ask of you. Someone comes up and asks, and you know what? I'm just going to give. I'm going to choose not to lay up treasures on earth. I could keep going. I'm not going to read the whole New Testament. But there's a lot of stuff there. And again, the, the danger when you hear some of this is like, oh, this just turns into some sort of legalism. Like, you have all this checkbox, and I'm going to like, if I do all this stuff, then I'm, you know, I merit... Christ, and it's this feeling of accomplishment, and that's, that's not what we're doing. All it is is an affirmation of identity. It's not a legalism where I'm going to be a self-made person, and I'm going to achieve all this stuff, and Jesus, you gave me this to-do list, and I, you know, conquered it, and I'm awesome, and you definitely should love me because of that. No, it's simply, I am Christ's, and Christ says this, therefore I'm going to do it. And it's an affirmation of our identity. So it's not legalism. It's not a matter of meriting something or deserving something. Rather, all it is is participating, participation. All it is is participation in Christ. And then the final, it's tied to the, the last point, but the final point is to ground your identity in Christ. Go through all of what we've talked about tonight. Really go through these exercises of, okay, who am I ultimately? Do I have peace? All of this stuff that we've talked about. And really make an effort to be sure that our identity is grounded in Christ. Um, Brother Finney has talked, I don't know if he's talked about it publicly as much, but he has this thing called truth-based transformation. I think he pinned it. And it's a really awesome thing. You can use it for a lot of stuff. It's like when you see these really cool truths, like some amazing quote that's like, oh, that's inspiring. 
you don't just accept it and it's like, oh, that's great, and then move on and forget about it. You actually log them somewhere. You put them somewhere. And then you have this list. He actually goes every single morning with these different lists and like reads them over and over and over so they enter into the deepest part of who we are. Because you can hear, I am Christ's, and it's like, okay, that's great. But if we hear that over and over and ground ourselves in it and like make that our daily devotion, daily meditation, that starts to enter into a deeper part of who we are. Um, so find who you want to be. Find the things that inspire you about Christ and make a list of them. And then don't just like acknowledge them, but rehearse them over and over and over. An actor rehearses his lines so that it's like he starts to feel the, the being of those lines. He starts to like really take on the identity of the person he's trying to, to imitate. And Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Like that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be rehearsing the lines over and over so that we can better become of Christ. Then there's some explicit ways to do this. Maybe it's just taking some time and remembering your baptism. Why did you get baptized? Why, why did you go through that? What was going through your mind then? And can you replicate that today? Like all those decisions that you were going to make, all, that, all those decisions that you did make, go back and renew them. Go back and say, oh, wait, I did die with Christ. Oh, wait, I was raised with him. Oh, wait, I did give up everything. I renounced, like, rehearse those. Maybe it's at the Eucharist. We remember that we're bought and that we're not our own. So, all of that to be said, in this whole, you know, you know, existential drama of living, we get to choose our identities. We get to put on clothing. And that's how we're known by God. We put on Christ daily. Notice that in the final part of Revelation, we don't just return back to the garden. It's not just like, okay, we did it. Like, everyone, we're going back to taking clothes off again, just like Adam and Eve. Like, that's not what happens. Instead, what happens is that we're given garments of white, garments of righteousness. Like, that's what we're aiming for. And so, all that to say, Christ is the only identity. Christ is the only one in the midst of all of these things that can give peace and promise true and lasting peace. Every other identity, when it's not kept in check, promises toil, tribulation, angst, stress. If my ultimate identity is a father or a mother, like there's a lot of great things about that, but ultimately it's going to produce angst and stress. Like how am I ever going to be the perfect father, the perfect mother? If my ultimate identity is as, you know, a faithful church person, again, that's like, being judged by you guys, and all of a sudden I'm comparing myself to this person and that person. It just produces this feeling of angst and stress. And so it's this idea that God is the only thing that we can worship that's not going to consume us and spit us back out. If I worship money, if I worship sexuality, if I worship, you know, motherhood, fatherhood, if that becomes the thing that I worship, every other thing devours us. But if I worship Christ and I put him at the very top of my existence, even in the midst of not feeling it, not knowing up from down the dark parts of life, that's, that's where there's peace. And all that to say, it's an act of faith, and it's an act of faith that we have to renew every single day. So, what did we talk about? Our clothing is our identity, and our identity is clothing. All these different roles that we have in life, we put on, we take off, they come, they go, they change, but there's only one that's lasting. So two, we're really bad at making things that last. Like ultimately, everything that I put my hand to, none of it's going to last because I'm, I'm not God. I'm finite. Everything that I make is going to be finite. And three, we are the sum total of the decisions we make. Every habit, every decision, you know, it might be the smallest decision in the world, but none of them are neutral. And at the same time, there's not one decision that you can just point to and be like, oh, man, I read the news on Tuesday, March 22nd, 2024, and it just wrecked my spiritual life. No, it's something bigger than that. It's compounding over time, over time. It's not like, oh, I prayed once on March 22nd, and you know, now I'm a Christian forever. No, it's something bigger than that. So all that to say, ponder the path of your feet, ponder the ruts that you're in, ponder who you are, and accept, not just achieve, accept the peace that Christ offers you 
by being his. So that's what I have to share with you tonight.